Waterloo, Napoleon's Last Battle is a two-player operational area impulse war game that simulates the battle between the French army of Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and the British and Prussian armies of the Seven Coalition in what is known as the Battle of Waterloo on the 18th of June, 1815. Let's take a look at the game components. The game includes three sheets of counters. Two sheets of these are for unit and leader counters, and there's another sheet for round French control markers. And the counters in this game measure three-fourths of an inch. The game also includes two identical two-sided player aid cards with all the charts and tables needed to play the game. In addition, there are three letter-sized setup cards to facilitate setting up the French, British, and Prussian armies. The game includes a 36-page rulebook. Actual rules cover 27 pages. There are two pages for optional rules. And there is a significant number of illustrations throughout the rulebook. And it also includes a five-page example of play. The map is divided into 90 areas. And there are three off-map zones from which the Prussian forces enter play as reinforcements. There are various terrain types, such as clear terrain, clear elevated, and these have round identifiers, forest terrain that has triangle identifiers, and village terrain, which has a square identifier. The terrain effects modifier adds strength to the defense value of the area, and it ranges from plus one to plus four. There are two types of area boundaries, regular area boundaries shown in white and streams shown in blue. Some areas are worth victory points. The game includes a turn record track and the game can last up to 10 turns unless there's an automatic victory before and each turn represents the passage of one hour. There's also an impulse track to record the current impulse during a turn. There's a victory point track also included, and the game starts with the victory point marker in the zero space. When a player scores victory points, the marker is moved along the victory point track to the left if scoring French victory points, and to the right if scoring allied victory points. Most units in the game have two sides, a front or full strength side, and in the back, the unit is shown at reduced strength. This is the spent side. There are four types of units in the game. Infantry, cavalry, artillery, and skirmishers. Each of these units in their top left corners show the unit's attack strength. In the bottom left corner is the unit's defense strength. And finally, in the bottom right corner, we find the unit's movement allowance. In this game, artillery units have a differently colored attack strength to remind players that artillery units cannot be the point unit in an assault. The spent side of an artillery unit also denotes that it cannot be used for bombardment while spent and it cannot move. Skirmishers in this game are mostly one-step unit. There are some that have two steps. If these one-step units are required to take a loss, they are eliminated. In this game, there are also counters for commanders and leaders. The commanders in this game are Napoleon on the French side, with Murat acting as commander only when Napoleon is inactive. On the Allied side, the commanders are Wellington for the Anglo-Allied Army, and Marshal Blucher for the Prussians. On the commander and leader counters, the large number on the lower left corner is the activation number. A player must roll this number or higher with 2d6 to activate the commander or leader. On a leader counter, the smaller number on the right is the leader's battle rating, which is used in attack and defense. Commanders and leaders are not placed on the map, 
but outside of the map in front of each player, and they are used to activate units and conduct special actions. Their front side denotes that they are active, and their back side denotes that they are spent or inactive. Units and leaders are assigned to color-coded formations. For example, here we see the French Second Corps as denoted by the orange bar on the top of the counters. On the Allied side, for example, here we see the Anglo-Allied First Corps denoted by the green bar. We will be going through various aspects of the game and then we will set up and go through the extended example of play found in the rulebook. As stated before, this game may last up to 10 turns, and in each turn there is a variable number of impulses. Each impulse is a mini turn, and each turn has the following phases. In the commander phase, beginning in turn two, the French player determines if Napoleon is active or inactive for that turn. And during this phase, all other commanders and all leaders automatically flip to their fresh sides. Next is the rally phase, starting in turn two. In this phase, each fresh leader may rally up to two units belonging to his formation. However, if a leader rallies any units, he becomes spent. Next is the Grand Battery phase. Here, the French player may conduct bombardment with all his artillery units in the same area as the Grand Battery marker. Next is the Action Impulse phase, where players alternate attempting to activate their units and conducting regular or special actions with them. Let's take a look first at the regular actions. These are move slash assault. Units from one area may move and assault enemy units in the same area. Volley fire. Here fresh infantry units in the same formation in a contested area with enemy units may volley fire. The bombardment action. Here all artillery units of the same formation in the active area may bombard enemy units in an adjacent area. Next is the general advance action. Here, the active player may move every friendly unit, it could be fresh or spent units, from a leader's formation, irrespective of where they are on the map, one area or zone, but these may not enter enemy occupied areas. Next is the Cavalry Charge Action. In this action, cavalry units of the same formation may move across clear areas and assault enemy units in a clear area. Artillery units become spent when using a general advance impulse. And finally, there's the Pass Action. Here the active player may elect to pass this impulse, and if both players pass consecutively, the action phase ends. There are various special actions that can be done by commanders. The commander, if successfully rolling equal or higher than his activation rating, may perform one of these special actions. The double move special action. This allows the player to take two action impulses, activating two areas either sequentially or in combination. And this is the only way that units from two different areas may assault an enemy area at the same time. The other special action is intervention. This special action allows the commander to change the result of an assault from a failure to stalemate or from a stalemate to success. And finally, there's the sunset roll cancellation special action. Following a sunset dice roll that would end the action impulse phase, either player may attempt to change a failed sunset dice roll to a pass. At the end of each allied action impulse, the allied player rolls two dice. This is known as the sunset roll. If the result is equal or greater than the current impulse number, the impulse marker advances to the next impulse and the action phase continues. However, 
if the result is less than the current impulse number or if the impulse marker moves off the impulse track, the action impulse ends and players advance to the end phase. And finally, in the end phase, players check to see if an automatic victory has occurred, and if not, the game proceeds to the next turn and the impulse marker is placed on the zero box. Leaders in this game can also conduct special actions. The leader rerolls special action, in which a fresh leader may reroll his dice after seeing the results of both players' dice rolls in an assault. The leader has to be from the same formation as the point unit. And then there's the leader battle participation special action. A fresh leader may add his battle rating to an assault by announcing that he is participating in the battle and after the attack value and defense value are calculated, the leader's battle rating is added. Using a leader in any of these special leader actions spends the leader. As stated before, the game may last up to 10 turns and it can end before the conclusion of turn 10 with an automatic victory. If at the end of any turn prior to turn 10, the allied player's victory marker is on his side in the 10 space, he wins. Similarly, if the French victory marker is in the French 10 space, the French player wins. Otherwise, the game proceeds till the end of turn 10 and players tally victory points and determine the winner. Victory points are earned per control of victory point areas. And in addition, a side gains one victory point per eliminated non-skirmisher enemy unit. However, each Imperial Guard unit is worth three victory points. At the end of the game, each side also receives half a victory point for each enemy infantry, British rifle skirmisher or cavalry unit that remains spent on the map. Victory points are tallied, and for the French player to win, the victory point marker must be on the French 8 or higher box. If the marker is between the French 2 and 7 boxes, the game ends in a draw, and if the marker is in the French 1 box or to the left, the allied player wins, and there's various degrees of victory. We will take a look now at the extended example of play that is found in the rulebook. Before we go into the extended example of play found in the rulebook, I'm going to show you an example of how the activation system works, focusing only on leaders being activated and the impulse system, because I think this is one of the most important and interesting aspects of this game. For purposes of this example, we will assume that we are starting the 1500 hour turn. This is the fifth turn of the game. If you see the next space, the 1600 hour, the first Prussian elements of the uh, fourth core, the fourth Prussian core enters the game in zone two. But we will use this uh, fifth turn to show you uh, how units are activated and the uncertainty of the impulse system. You never know when the turn is going to end. And the first phase is the commander phase. Here we roll for Napoleon to see if he is active or inactive in this turn, and then we flip all other leaders and commanders to their front sides. So we roll 2d6, and uh, for Napoleon to be active, the roll has to be equal or greater than his activation rating of 8. And the roll is a 9, so Napoleon will be active in this turn, and what he will contribute, as long as he is face up, is that plus 1 that you see in a white circle. Whenever any of his subordinate, his leaders, will roll for activation, a plus 1 will be added to the die roll, which enhances the chances of the uh, nominated leader to be activated. Now, in addition, during the commander phase, all face uh, down leaders are now flipped to their active sides. So here we see all French core leaders are now face up, including Ney, and note that Ney, uh, he commands his own core, which are the units with the yellow band, but if Napoleon would have been inactive, Ney acts as overall 
uh, commander for the French forces, but not in this turn because Napoleon in this turn is active. Now we uh, flip face up all face down allied leader units and also Wellington. And that's the end of the commander phase. Note that there's no Prussian units in this turn because this is the fifth turn. Now we go to the rally phase where any successfully activated leader can rally two units belonging to his formation. Example, the French player wants to rally two units of Milord's 4th Cavalry Corps, so he would flip those two units face up and Milord would be flipped to his spent side. Note that during the upcoming action phase, uh, the player may nominate Milod's 4th Cavalry Corps to be activated, but he has to roll 8 or more. And now it's the Anglo-Allied's turn. And let's say that they want to rally two units of Picton's Reserve Corps. So those two units are flipped face up on the map. And Picton's counter is flipped to its spent side. Note then that on its spent side, there is no battle rating. So you cannot use Picton to influence a battle either while he is spent. Now we go to the Grand Battery phase. We will assume that the Grand Battery opens fire at uh, one of the areas using indirect fire, but we will not show it here. So we would proceed now to the Action phase, and here we proceed by impulses, starting with the French first impulse. And we place the impulse marker with the French side showing on the number one circle. So let's say that the French want to activate Rail's second core for some uh, move and assault actions. First, we have to roll 2d6, and Rail has a rating of 7 or more. But because Napoleon is active, 1 is added to the dice roll. So we roll 2d6, and the roll is a 6 modified to a 7, exactly what the French need. So Rail's second core is... Uh, activated and let's assume it moves and conducts assaults on the map and we flip rails uh, leader marker to its backside it is now spent and now we go to the anglo allied first impulse and let's say that the anglo allied player wants to move uh, picton's units all of uh, its units one space to organize for an upcoming attack, and that's called a general advance action. So in that case, the Anglo-Allied player has to roll eight or more, but note that Wellington is active, so he provides a plus one die roll modifier. We roll 2d6, and the result is a nine modified to a 10, so Picton's reserve corps is successfully activated, and its units conduct that general advance action. And that's the end of the Allied first impulse. And now we proceed to the French second impulse. Note that we did not roll for a sunset die roll during the end of the Allied first impulse because it's just impossible to obtain a result uh, lower than the impulse number in that first impulse. So now let's say that the French want to conduct move and assault uh, actions with Derlon's first corps. So we roll 2d6 and add 1 for Napoleon's uh, modifier because he's active. And the roll is a 2 modified to a 3, so that is lower than Derlon's 7 activation rating. So uh, this particular instance, the leader is not activated and the effect is the same as a pass action. And we do not flip to its spent side, Derlon's leader marker. Now we go to the Anglo-Allied second impulse. And the Anglo-Allied player, having seen the French practically pass in this impulse by failing an activation roll, now decides to want to activate Hill's second corps for also a general advance in order to accommodate his units for a further assault down the line in this particular turn. So, the Anglo-Allied player rolls two dice and needs seven or more. And there's a plus one die roll modifier. Roll is an eight modified to a nine, so Hill's core is successfully activated. And Hill's units conduct a general advance. 
It's the end of the Anglo Allied second impulse, and now we roll two dice. This is the sunset dice roll, and if the result is equal or less than the current impulse number, in this case two, the action phase ends. And the result is a five, so it does not end. And we proceed to French impulse three. Now the French want to activate Ney's core, and Ney has an activation rating of seven, so we roll 2d6 and add one for Napoleon's activation bonus. The result is a seven modified to an eight, and Ney is successfully activated. And his core conducts moves and assault actions on the map. Now to the Anglo-Allied third impulse. And the Anglo-Allied player wants to conduct a double move. That's a special commander action. And we have to roll 2d6 and roll 7 or higher, which is Wellington's activation rating. And if successful, two cores will be activated. In this case, it would be uh, Hills and Picton's. Uh, but you will not flip uh, any of those leader counters in connection with this particular special action. And the roll is a six, so Wellington fails the special double move activation. So this becomes a pass, and notice that Wellington's counter is not flipped to its spent side for failing this uh, special activation. Now we roll to see if the turn ends. The roll is a seven, so we continue to the fourth French impulse. Napoleon wants to activate Ney's core once again. Notice that Ney's counter is spent, so we will use Ney's spent activation leader of eight as a base, but there's still that plus one bonus that the commander uh, imparts to these uh, dice rolls as long as he's active. The result is a nine modified to a ten, so Ney's core is successfully activated, and its units conduct regular actions such as move and assault and those are performed on the board. Now we go to the Anglo-Allied fourth impulse. Let's say that the Anglo-Allied player now wants to activate Orange's first core. Uh, we roll 2d6 and we need six or more but there's a plus one bonus from Wellington. The roll is a 10 modified to an 11 so Orange's first core is activated and it performs move and assault actions. That's the end of the Anglo-Allied fourth impulse, and now the sunset dice roll. And the roll is an eight, so the action phase continues. Now to the fifth French impulse. And let's say the French want to activate Kellerman's third cavalry corps to perform a charge action. So we roll 2d6, and uh, the French need six or more with a plus one modifier for Napoleon's activation bonus. Roll is an 8 modified to a 9 and Kellerman's core is successfully activated. Its units perform a charge and we flip Kellerman's leader counter to its spent side. Now to the Anglo-Allied fifth impulse. And let's say Wellington wants to uh, perform again that special double move action to try to move units from two cores, let's say Hills and Pictons, once again. So we roll 2d6 and the Anglo-Allied player needs seven or more. And the result is a 10, so now that double move action will be performed on the board and the only uh, counter that is flipped, leader or commander counter, is Wellington's. So Wellington is now spent and this denotes a particular action where the commander is personally involved. So if both uh, leaders that are participating in the double move, their counters would have been fresh, you would not flip them to their spent sides. So now we perform the sunset dice roll, and this is the end of impulse five. And the roll is a four, so now the action phase will end unless any of the players can perform a Sunset dice roll cancellation special action with his commander. The French have Napoleon active, so Napoleon could perform this particular cancellation action. Well, the Anglo Allied player cannot perform it and probably does not, is not interested in doing so since the French have the burden of attack in this game. 
and the French decide that they will attempt to cancel this successful sunset dice roll. So Napoleon first has to roll equal or higher than his activation rating to do so. So we roll 2d6. The roll is a 10, so Napoleon successfully cancels the sunset dice roll. But now Napoleon is flipped to his inactive side, and notice that he will not be able to add that plus one bonus to leader activation die rolls during the balance of this action phase. So now we proceed to the French sixth impulse. Let's say that the French want to activate Drouot's Imperial Guard Corps. So they have to roll seven or more with two dice, and there's no activation bonus from Napoleon this time. And the roll is a six, so the activation dice roll fails. And now the impulse passes to the Anglo-Allied player. So now we go to the sixth Anglo-Allied impulse. So the Anglo-Allied player has here some tough decisions to make because uh, the chances of activating Orange's, Hill's, or Picton's core is less than 50%. The best activation probability is Uxbridge Cavalry Corps, and then followed by Offerman. So let's say they'll try to activate Uxbridge's Cavalry Corps. We roll 2d6, and the roll is a 6, exactly what the Anglo-Allied player needed, the minimum. So Uxbridge's Cavalry Corps Units in one area perform move assault actions, and that concludes the sixth Anglo Allied impulse. And now we have the sunset dice roll once again. And now the roll is a four, which is lower than the number of the impulse in which we are in six. So that will conclude the action phase because no player can actually cancel this sunset dice roll. So having concluded the action phase, we would be now going to the end phase. And in the end phase, we would be checking to see if there's an automatic victory in this turn. If not, we would proceed to the next turn. And that ends this particular activation example. The game's rulebook includes two extended examples of play, one dealing with movement, and the other an example of an assault. And we will show these now, and we will set up the game and follow along. First, the extended example of play regarding movement. In this example, the French player announces that he will attempt to activate Reille, who is the leader of the Second Corps. Reille is on his fresh side, and he requires a seven or higher to activate. The French player will roll two dice, and he will add the bonus that Napoleon provides to activation die rolls, which is the number in the white circle. And that's because Napoleon is active. So we roll 2d6, and the roll is a 6 modified to a 7, just what the French needed to activate Rayleigh. So Rayleigh successfully activates, and now the French player announces that he will activate second core units, which is the core that Rayleigh commands, that are in Area 46. Note that the French player cannot issue orders to Blanchard's Cavalry Brigade because Blanchard belongs to a different formation. That's Kellerman's 3rd Cavalry Corps. And the French player decides to execute a move-slash-assault impulse. The French player moves Husson and the infantry unit beneath, which is Baudin's, and also Hubert's cavalry brigade at the bottom with a movement factor of 6 into Area 45. Because Area 45 is occupied by at least one fresh British unit, the movement cost to enter the area is 4 movement factors. The map board has a player aid that summarizes the movement costs, and we see there 4 movement factors to enter an area containing a fresh enemy unit. The two infantry units have a movement allowance of four, and they've spent four movement factors, and the bottom cavalry brigade has a movement allowance of six. However, 
the movement of the stack immediately ends because it entered an area occupied by an enemy unit. In addition, because the area is occupied only by enemy units, this move will require a mandatory assault. The artillery unit moves into Area 61 to join Dunop's Cavalry Brigade. This artillery unit was fresh, otherwise it would have a zero movement allowance and would not be able to move. Additionally, this artillery unit is not prohibited from entering the area because it is a previously contested area. That is, it began the impulse with both a French and British unit in the area. The movement cost for the artillery unit is three movement factors as the area was previously contested. The artillery unit must end its movement when it enters the contested area because it contains an enemy unit and once it has completed its move the artillery unit flips from its fresh to its spent side. And now we focus our attention to Gauthier's Infantry Brigade which moves to Area 30 and this costs two movement factors because the unit is entering a vacant area adjacent to an enemy unit. The French player decides to move that unit no further and places a French control marker in the area. Notice that Gautier still had two movement factors remaining, but the French decide to stop movement there. And that concludes the movement example in the rulebook. Now we proceed to this assault example of play. During his impulse, a French player announces that he will attempt to activate Napoleon for a double move special action. And this is a special action that can only be performed by commanders in the game. Napoleon is on his fresh or active side, so the French player needs to roll an 8 or more with two dice. So we roll 2d6, and the roll is a 10, and Napoleon has successfully been activated for a double move special action. Had the French player failed Napoleon's activation roll, his impulse would have ended for the failed activation attempt. So, for his first of two activations, the French player activates Area 15, which contains Husson, Baudouin, which is spent, and Campi's brigades of Reilly's corps. And these units are activated for a move slash assault impulse. And the activated units move into Area 33. The movement cost to enter the area is four movement factors. The units have sufficient movement allowance. Each of these units has a movement allowance of four. And they enter area 33, which is occupied solely by enemy units, so this will require a mandatory assault. Note that Thevenet's brigade of Lobos Corps cannot be moved with Reyles' brigade, as only one formation in the area has been activated, that is, Reyles' corps. The French player could have instead activated Thevenet's brigade from Lobos' corps as his first activation, but elects not to do so. The French player has one activation remaining as part of his double move special action. He could decide to activate Thévenet, but that would conclude his double move special action, and he has other plans. So the French player now chooses Area 31 to be activated. And he moves the 6th Corps Artillery, Belair, and Bonnie's Brigade, all which are part of Lobau's formation, and also the skirmisher into area 33. And note that as this is a double move special action, Napoleon is permitted to activate two separate formations in a single area or two different areas. Again, the area is occupied by at least one fresh British unit, so the movement cost to enter the area is four movement factors. 
And also, uh, there will be a mandatory assault because this area was not contested at the start of the impulse. It was occupied solely by enemy units. And finally, note that the 6th Corps artillery unit may move into the area as it is accompanied by other units, but it is considered non-participating in the assault. And artillery units that move as part of a move-slash-assault impulse are always spent at the conclusion of their move. Because Napoleon was used for special action, Napoleon's counter is now flipped to his spent or inactive side. And note that when this happens with Napoleon, that is, when he becomes inactive, Ney is now the active French commander and is available to attempt commander special actions. Having completed movement now, the player resolves the mandatory assault, and the French player nominates one unit as its point unit, and that will be Husson's brigade. And we mark it with that small blue point. So Husson is the point unit. And now the allied player has to announce which of his units will be the forward defending unit. And the allied player designates Kemp's brigade as the forward defending unit. Now the players calculate their respective attack and defense values. And we'll start calculating first the French attack value. Note that the French player's point unit has three attack factors, plus there are three additional fresh infantry units, and each one of these adds plus two uh, for attack value purposes. So that is three plus six, we're at nine. We add one spent infantry unit, and that adds a plus one, and that's Baudouin's. So we're now at 10. And we have to add half a point for each skirmisher unit. There's only one, but it's half a point rounded down, so we're still at an attack value of 10 for the French. Now we calculate the defensive value for the British side. Now we calculate the defensive value for the British side. The British player's forward defending unit has four of a defensive value, so we start at 4, plus 2 for the terrain effects modifier of area 33, so we're at 6, and the British have two additional fresh units, that is PAX, infantry unit, and HAYS, artillery unit. And note that we count HAYS here uh, differently from the French side, where the 6th Corps uh, artillery, which moved, cannot participate in the combat. So, the British have a total defense value of 8. And because the point assaulting unit is from Rail's formation, the French 2nd Corps, the French player can now elect to commit Rail, who is fresh, with the Battle Participation Special Action. For this special action, no activation role is necessary, and it's not necessary for any leader special action. If Rail had been spent, he could not be able to use this action. But he is fresh, so he now adds his battle rating of plus 3 to the French attack value, bringing the French total from 10 to 13. But because Rail was used for a special action, he is now flipped from his fresh to his spent side. So now it's the British player's turn to decide whether he wants to commit a leader to the battle, and his forward defending unit is from Picton's formation. So he can only use Picton with a 3 battle rating for a leader special action. Picton is fresh, so the British player could commit him to lead the defense for a plus 3 to his side's defensive value. However, he decides not to commit Picton. So now we compare the attack value and defense values. The French are at 13 and the British are at 8. So the French are considered at plus 5 
before the players roll dice. So now each side rolls 2d6. Having a plus 5, the French roll a 9 for a total of 14 and the allied player rolls a 4 and this is a crushing French attack. However, the allied player now announces that he will use Picton for a leader reroll special action. And this of course will flip Picton from fresh to spent, but now he will be able to reroll his side's dice. So we roll the Anglo Allied players 2d6 and the roll is a 10. So the French have an attack total of 14 and the Anglo Allied player has 10 for a difference of four on the French side. And because the French total was greater than the British total, the assault is a success. And now the British have to absorb the difference in casualty points. In this case, four casualty points need to be removed. The forward defensive unit, that is Kemp's brigade, has to absorb the first casualty point. So Kempt is flipped to its spent side for one casualty point. There's still three casualty points to go. Now the Allied player decides to flip Hayes' artillery battery to its spent side for its second casualty point. Now the Allied player decides to retreat Hayes' artillery unit for one casualty point and Hayes is retreated into Area 34. The Allied player cannot retreat Pack's brigade for the final casualty point because the unit is fresh, and in this game only spent units can retreat. So, for the last casualty point, the Allied player retreats Kemp's brigade, and the unit also retreats into Area 34. Note that in this example, the British retreated to Area 34, and the retreating British units have three viable areas to which they may retreat. In this case, areas 21, 34, and 35. Note that there are no areas to retreat that are not adjacent to a French unit. So the British player must follow the retreat priorities in the rules. Area 21 is adjacent to two areas containing French units, in this case, Area 33 and Area 15, while Areas 34 and 35 are adjacent to only one area containing French units, which is Area 33. And because these two areas are tied for retreat priority, the British player can choose between them, and in this case, the British chose to retreat to Area 34. The French player now flips his point unit from its fresh to its spent side. Following this successful assault, the area is now occupied by both French units which assaulted and one British brigade, that is, Pax Brigade. So this area will be considered a contested area for the next impulse and the French player's impulse is completed and it is now the British player's impulse and with that this example of an assault ends. And we've reached the end of this video. This is Waterloo, Napoleon's Last Battle published by Companion Games designed by Mark Scarborough. I hope this video has given you an idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. So, this is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.